Well, I've got uh, quite a talk here to cover. We were uh, t joking earlier about whether I'd be able to cover all of this. We're going to give it a try. If I have to cut some things out, uh, we, we will as we go along. Two parts. One is uh, on recent developments in the broader field of the studies of, uh, that have to do with human origins. All right, that'll take probably the better part of the hour. And then uh, some theological reflections that come out of that. Uh, the hominin lineage, I'm going to be using that phrase a lot, lineage. All right, the hominin lineage is the evolutionary pathway through which we human beings have come to live on Earth. This lineage begins with its divergence some six or seven million years ago from the line that led to chimpanzees. Now, in just the past decade or so, the scientific study of the hominin lineage has been expanded and modified by new discoveries and by technological advances that offer new insights into the remains of the past. This paper begins with a summary of a few of the highlights of recent research. I'm building upon a book that came out just a, a year and a half ago, uh, The End of Adam and Eve, and I'm, I'm skewing this paper in favor of covering uh, reports that have appeared since August of 2016. The science moves that fast. In fact, we're going to be talking about something that, wasn't, that was announced just two weeks ago, uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So these findings are interpreted in terms of the most plausible evolutionary scenario, <clears throat> the narrative account of the hominin lineage that experts have constructed in the attempt to make some sense of our evolutionary past. In particular, we ask how the recent findings prompt changes in this interpretive account. All right, so we've got data interpreted kind of as a first order exercise and then a broader in interpretive scenario that is added on top of it, scientifically informed, not yet the work of theologians or science writers or fiction authors, but, um, uh, but not pure uh, reading off of nature either. Then in the second half of the paper, we will ask how the revised story of our origins challenges and, and uh, provokes new perspectives in Christian theology. So a couple of assumptions. I think I will skip those. Um, they, they're pretty, pretty, pretty obvious uh, kinds of points. So let's go right on in to some of the recent discoveries. So if you're following along, we're at the top of page two. Uh, if the hominin lineage diverged from the line that led to chimpanzees roughly six to seven million years ago, a few of the recent discoveries take us back almost to the time of this divergence. It now appears that at least this far back, our ancestors had opposable toes, but walked upright on two legs. In other words, they, they never knuckle walked. Knuckle walking is believed to be a later adaptation by chimps and by gorillas, uh, evolving it independently. But our ancestors never knuckle walked, uh, spending time on the ground as well as in the trees. The earliest evidence of tool making has now been pushed back to almost 3.4 million years. Uh, that predates the emergence of the, uh, of the genus Homo. The earliest hint of the existence of anything that might be classified within the genus Homo has now been pushed back to 2.8 million years ago. So you have almost a half million year um, uh, jump on, uh, in, in, in terms of tool making. In this case, the claim, uh, the claim that uh, the genus Homo first appears at 2.8 million years is based on a very small fragment, half a mandible, right, half like this, half a mandible uh, with a few teeth, and some experts doubt that enough can be known from such a small fragment uh, to justify a genus or species designation. Even so, these findings suggest earlier and earlier dates for tools and for such things as smaller teeth and slightly less robust bones, signs of more modern um, uh, developments, uh, whether or not these belong to anything that should rightly be called homo. These discoveries also suggest that multiple forms or species of hominins often overlapped in time. It's not one following the other, but several, sometimes many, at once. 
uh, overlapped at time, in time, perhaps in the same territory, with small but internally diverse groups. Inside the groups was more diversity than we uh, tend to think. Um, that these populations were spread across various regions of Africa, living simultaneously for hundreds of thousands of years, or in the case of Homo erectus, almost a million and a half years. Whether or not they were in contact or interbred with each other is not known, at least not yet. Homo erectus appears to have evolved in Africa, but now we know that these hominids spread to Eurasia by about 1.8 million years ago, which is almost exactly the time of the first evidence of their showing up in Africa. By some accounts, Homo erectus survived in Asia until a mere 300,000 years ago, perhaps even later. Uh, over this expanse of time, there are significant changes in these fossils, especially brain size, prompting some to ask whether it's really best to classify all these remains as Homo erectus. A more important question has to do with the very notion of species and its continued usefulness in evolutionary biology generally. Overlapping all of this is the origins of the Neanderthals and their more recently discovered cousins, the Denisovans. Together, these two groups seem to have split off from earlier populations in Africa roughly 700,000 years ago, maybe earlier. They made their way to Eurasia. Uh, they seem to have disappeared in Africa, but made their way to Eurasia and split again into at least two and probably more distinct groups, giving rise to the Neanderthals and the Denisovans and perhaps to other populations who exist, whose existence is con conjectured on the basis of hints found in the DNA of later individuals. We now know that these populations interbred with somewhat more modern humans I'm going to use that technical phrase, somewhat more modern humans, a number of times. Uh, somewhat more modern humans who arrived later from Africa. In fact, interaction, uh, interbreeding, and gene flow between these populations in Eurasia and in Africa seems to have occurred again and again with temporary splitting followed by hybridization as key factors not just in hominin evolution, but it turns out in evolution of other species as well, but including uh, especially hominin evolution. Fascinating questions arise when we consider Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA. This tiny amount of DNA, mitochondrial DNA, exists in each cell in our bodies, not in the genome uh, found in the nucleus, but in tiny organelles called mitochondria. These mitochondria, with their mitochondrial DNA, are passed directly from mother to child with essentially no change in each generation. And so mitochondrial DNA offers a particularly useful tool for tracing maternal descent. Early Neanderthals and Denisovans had related mitochondrial DNA, consistent with their having diverged earlier from a common ancestral population. Later Neanderthals, however, had different mitochondrial DNA. It's one of the big mysteries of, of Neanderthal genetics at the moment. Had different mitochondrial DNA, somewhat more like our own, not identical, but somewhat more like our own than the earlier version. No one knows how to explain this, but it seems that our mitochondrial DNA and that of the later Neanderthals came from a common source, probably in Africa, and probably predating 300,000 years ago, maybe even further. Comparative analysis suggests that this later Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA not only enters the European Eurasian population of Neanderthals somewhere around 250,000 years ago, but perhaps completely replaces the older version of my, uh, Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA. In the meantime, African hominin populations continued to evolve, producing what experts tend to call derived traits or somewhat more modern traits, somewhat more like today's human beings with larger brains, smaller teeth, and less robust bones. These are not yet Homo sapiens which are sometimes referred to as modern humans or anatomically modern humans, but transitions in that direction are evident even before 200,000 years ago. 
Now, one of the really startling finds of just about uh, nine months ago uh, is, is uh, what I'm going to refer to next. Recent redating of fossils found in Morocco reveal a population of somewhat modern humans, you know, somewhat derived traits, right, uh, living there between 220 and 380,000 years ago, somewhere in that window of time. This date suggests that the generally accepted timeline for the first appearance or the emergence of modern humans needs to be pushed back by quite a lot. Also surprising is the location of this population. Not where we've all been trained to expect it, in East Africa, Ethiopia or Somalia perhaps, uh, not in East Africa, widely thought to be the home of modern humans, but in the continent's northwest corner. So, very strange time, very strange place. Together with other discoveries from the far southern tip of Africa, the Morocco discovery suggests a pan-Africa origin of modern traits. And, and let me parse that a little bit further. So, one, one trait, you know, smaller teeth, maybe here, Another trait, finer bones over here, uh, it, 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 not as part, so, so at no point does the entire modern package sort of appear suddenly, but a trait here, a trait there that suggests modernity. And then the, the uh, paleobiologists, uh, anthropologists tend to use the term mosaic to refer to this kind of composite of mo modern and more ar archaic traits in one skeleton. That can be misleading because geneticists, as we know, use mosaic to refer to quite something different. So, so be a little cautious, but sometimes you see the word mosaic uh, to suggest um, that the, 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 the fossils have surprises uh, kind of embedded in them. Um, which means if you find only a part, you have to ask, well, is this the odd part or is this the more typical part of the, if we had the whole thing? So it, it, it's, it, it's fascinating watching the uh, debates uh, around these things. Um, so rather than appearing rapidly, rather than derived or modern or anatomically modern or homo sapiens, appearing rapidly and altogether in one population in East Africa between 150,000 and 200,000 years ago, the latest evidence suggests that many of the characteristics, characteristic traits of modern humans appear gradually here and there, starting as much as 300,000 years ago and extending over a wide expanse in multiple populations that were intermittently connected. Uh, in fact, the new analysis of DNA from southern Africa suggests that the ancestors of today's Khosan people split from other populations about 260 to 350,000 years ago. Now, there's been interbreeding since, but uh, the, their ancestry can be traced back to a line that diverged from uh, all other known living human beings uh, at somewhere in that window of time. These new insights suggest the distinct strands of ancestral humans and the gene flow be among these groups. Uh, is, um, th these, these, these new insights are possible because of rapid advances in the field of paleogenomics, the recovery and sequencing of ancient DNA. About a decade ago, just prior to the first publication of the uh, Neanderthal uh, DNA ge uh, genome, uh, and their comparisons with today's modern human genomes, it was generally believed that successful interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans was unlikely to have occurred. Today, by contrast, the techniques have advanced so much that we can track specific DNA sequences from moderns to Neanderthals, or conversely, from Neanderthals to moderns, looking for possible benefits and adaptive value in introgressed genes. We can discover whole new hominin species, such as the Denisovans, by extracting their genomes from the tiniest of physical remains. Literally, this, this little bone in the pinky finger uh, is, is the source of the discovery of a whole new uh, species, or population at least, of hominins. We can sift through 
comparative genomic data for telltale signs of ghost populations, diverged human communities that must have existed as evolutionary sources of DNA found in today's humans, nothing recent has changed our view of our origins as much as paleogenomics. Newly discovered fossils and artifacts, however, have also uh, contributed new insight. The newly identified species Homo naledi is based on the discovery of remarkably complete skeletal remains of some 15 individuals, and that has reawakened interest in exploration and has added puzzling complexity to the story of the past. Despite the fact that Homo naledi shares many features, including small brain size, with hominins from roughly one million years ago, these particular remains are dated to a surprisingly late window of 236,000 to 335,000 years ago. These numbers probably are, are you, you, obviously you can't uh, keep track of them all, but notice the similarity of range here, uh, uh, Homo naledi and the Morocco discovery. Roughly, uh, I mean, different ends of Africa, but very different forms of, uh, of hominin life. Um, so, uh, living at roughly the same time. This suggests that the relatively archaic Homo naledi lived through the period in which other human populations were developing significantly larger brains and other traits we see as modern. At the same time, tantalizing clues uh, suggest that some of the early modern groups may have left Africa much earlier than we thought just a year ago. Recent redating of uh, modern looking uh, human fossils in Israel suggests that the standard view of modern humans coming out of Africa only 100,000 years ago may need to be pushed back significantly in time. An upper jaw, maxilla, uh, upper jaw fragment with some teeth found uh, not far from where Jesus walked, if any of you have uh, taken the Holy Land tour and uh, explored around Mount Carmel. It, it cave near, uh, it, at Mount Carmel is the source of lots of interesting uh, remains, but uh, one uh, relatively modern uh, looking uh, set of remains now dated to 177 to 194,000 years ago vastly earlier than anybody had thought uh, uh, modern humans, so-called modern humans, had left Africa. Quote, this finding changes our view on modern human dispersal and is consistent with recent genetic studies which have posited the possibility of an earlier dispersal of Homo sapiens around 220,000 years ago. Another clue uh, is, uh, comes from the discovery of surprisingly advanced tools in India, uh, refined stone tools in a style more consistent with modern humans is now dated 172,000 to as much as 385,000, again pushing that window way and way back. When we try to put all this together, we can see that these findings taken as a whole suggest that the standard out of Africa scenario needs significant revisions. This scenario or theory which gained ground among experts in the 1990s and was widely accepted until about a decade ago, involves several claims. Stated in the simplest and strongest terms, the out of Africa scenario begins with the idea that something very much like anatomically modern humans, that is to say people who look a lot like us, appeared as a small population in East Africa sometime between 150,000 and 200,000 years ago. What caused them to appear? Only conjectures can be offered, but most advocates of the out-of-Africa theory believe that the most likely explanation involved genetic mutations or significant changes in gene expression, perhaps in response to environmental or climate, uh, climate changes. Uh, this population established itself, so the theory goes, established itself as a distinct community, perhaps genetically different enough over time to be considered a distinct species, Homo sapiens, their numbers grew, they spread throughout Africa and Eurasia, again, that's the standard theory. They met other hominins, such as Neanderthals, but they did not interbreed, eventually, perhaps because of superior mental abilities or more sophisticated tools uh, they, um, or, 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 or better weapons. They completely replaced all previous forms of humans, again, that's standard theory, 
Their tools and material culture continued to advance and become more complex. As language became more sophisticated, they created artifacts of symbolic value, culminating in a so-called cultural Big Bang, about uh, 35 to 40,000, maybe as early as 45,000 years ago, and evidenced eventually by the magnificent cave art that we can see to this day. Every human being alive today, according to this theory, is descended from this original population that first appeared in East Africa, and all human diversity is due to regional adaptations since the time of migration. No sooner had theologians engaged the 1990s version of Out of Africa than cracks began to develop in some of its claims. As we have seen, these cracks have now widened to the point that the Out of Africa scenario is in need of a significant makeover. Modern human traits did not begin only 200,000 years ago, or in a single population, or in any way that was complete or fully developed in any early population. Whatever exactly may have been going on in East Africa around 150,000 years ago is still important to our story of human origins, but we should not think of it as a kind of evolutionary break with, an primitive, from a, a, a break with a primitive past or the start of a new species as if Homo sapiens suddenly appeared on the evolutionary landscape. It is virtually a certain that this population, about which we still know almost nothing, interacted and interbred with other populations across Africa Already, by about 300,000 years ago, a large, diverse, pan-African network of interacting human populations appears to have split into at least two lineages, one leading to the ancestral source of today's Kosan, the other to the ancestral source of other humans across Africa and eventually the rest of the globe. Some have suggested that if we were to try to picture this human lineage, we should not think of an evolutionary tree with neatly separated branches or twigs, so much as a tangled vine or a braided stream. One team of researchers describes the pattern uh, of the human lineage this way. We view the emergence of our lineage as a continuing dynamic process rather than an outcome or product. There is no clear starting point or ending point, but rather an ongoing, repeating process of divergence and hybridization at multiple points in its evolutionary history. It is the dynamics of this repeated lineage divergence and remerger that has produced the variation observable in our genome and phenome today we would not expect the directional accumulation of, modern, of modernity in such a scenario, but rather a sporadic flickering signal." Uh, end of quote. What becomes then of the concept of the species, the human species? Uh, again, quoting uh, this team of writers, uh, Ackerman uh, and her associates, considering Homo sapiens as a single complex lineage Note the language there. Considering Homo sapiens as a single, single complex lineage with significant divergence and uh, anatomous, uh, anatomatosis along the, uh, among the subgroups, that is to say rejoining, it's a term uh, more widely used in medical uh, uh, literature, a rejoining among subgroups, is the most inclusive and accurate approach. Uh, this team is suggesting, in other words, that we redirect our focus from the narrow concept of species, which is all dr drilled into all of us in our first biology class, narrow concept of species, toward the wider idea of lineage. Uh, this perspective, which we will call a lineage-centric view, uh, in contrast to the species-centric view, nicely captures the key insights that have dominated the field of human origins research over the past decade. Let's see how we're doing on time here. Uh, we're halfway through. halfway through. Okay, just about. Yeah. All right, good. So uh, carrying on, um, a critically important component of the lineage view. Right. So I'm advocating a lineage view as opposed to a species-centric view. 
A critical import, uh, important component is the role of viable interbreeding, the exchange of DNA between two or more divergent groups. Gene integration, as the evolutionary biologists refer to it, is important for two reasons. First, it suggests a way in which we can think about basic evolutionary processes, mutation and selection, for example, as operating on multiple tracks at once. Let, let that sink in for a second. Ev evolution within a population, by virtue of diversity within, can operate on multiple tracks at once. Um, each divergent community evolves in its own way, with its own dynamics of mutation, environment, niche, uh, niche, select, uh, niche construction, and so forth. Uh, gene integration, on the other hand, also sometimes known as hybridization, provides a pathway in which, in which at least some successful adaptations may then enter the wider population. Uh, second, integration provides a check that limits the extent of divergence. A diverging population on a remote island, for example, may be cut off from integration, and over time the result might be a, the emergence of a new species, critically important in Darwin's discovery. In the absence of any strong physical barrier, however, that prevents interbreeding, a widely dispersed and internally diversified lineage, such as the hominin lineage, particularly one that likes to move around, experiences sufficient integration between subpopulations to maintain overall reproductive compatibility over time, allowing evolution to operate on multiple divergent tracks without necessarily splitting into two or more species. Such a process seems to have been underway on the African continent some 200 thousand to three hundred thousand years ago, it now appears that small groups of these somewhat modern humans began to leave Africa as, as early as two hundred thousand years ago, maybe earlier. They made their way along the southern parts of Asia to the islands and to Australia, reaching Europe about forty-five thousand years ago, and finally arriving in the Americas. They encountered other hominins and interbred, sometimes producing fertile offspring sometimes living in what must have been hybridized communities. The latest genetic studies also suggest that through interbreeding, the newcomers acquired traits that helped them adopt, uh, adapt, to genetically, uh, adapt genetically to environments unlike anything in Africa. Now, we want to switch from a focus on the, um, the, the, the biology more to the evolution of culture. The story of the rise of human creativity and symbolic culture has also been revised. Those who study the culture of the first modern Europeans in Europe about 45,000 years ago believe the Neanderthals may have learned new technologies from the newcomers. Cultural diffusion of techniques, however, may also have occurred in the opposite direction with the newcomers learning from the Neanderthals. There's no direct evidence to support this idea, um, but we do not know that, uh, that uh, but we do know that well before the moderns arrived, the Neanderthals were making decorative beads. One recent finding concerns a Neanderthal, uh, Neanderthal construction project deep inside a cave, Bunacoc Cave in southern France, dating uh, to 176,000 years ago, um, then the fascinating thing is that it's a, it's a thousand feet from the entrance. So they had to have some very good torches and they had to have a very good buddy system. Uh, you, using uh, pieces of stalagmites, the Neanderthals built structures roughly a thousand feet from the cave opening. These may be the oldest surviving hominin structures on the planet. Now, just two weeks ago, uh, using a, a new dating uh, technology, uranium thorium dating, uh, researchers uh, just shocked all the experts who, who follow this stuff with the announcement that um, cave art in Spain, not at one cave, not one isolated uh, set of drawings, but at three different caves date uh, the, 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 that, that art dates back roughly 100, uh, I'm sorry, roughly 64 to 65,000 years ago, minimally, and possibly older than that. Who was living there then? Uh, the prevailing view is only the Neanderthals. 
The so-called moderns had not yet gotten there. Who were the first artists? Presumably then the Neanderthals. It is, so uh, I'll, I'll refer to that uh, once again. It is, <laughs> before that discovery, I mean just, just writing three weeks ago, this is what I wrote. It is generally believed that the newcomers were somewhat more advanced in cultural complexity than their Neanderthal counterparts. That sentence has definitely got to be revised. Um, at this point, we don't know what to believe, but the, 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 the new discovery would count as significant counter evidence. In the time, the newcomers, uh, in time, the newcomers produced symbolic artifacts, not just mixing pigments and drilling shells as beads, but carving figurines, etching on cave walls and floors, drilling holes in bone flutes, and painting on walls deep inside caves. In Western Europe, musical instruments, figurines, and cave painting first appear just a little over 40,000 years ago. Recent analysis suggests that the extraordinary paintings of uh, Chauvet Pont de Arc uh, in uh, France were created in two, dis quote, in quote, uh, two distinct periods of human activity in the cave, one from 37 to 33,500 uh, years ago, then a brief hiatus probably bad climate, and the other from 31 to 28,000 years ago by different populations. Uh, very interesting. It is tempting to see these paintings as proof of a cultural Big Bang. The evidence, uh, uh, however, suggests that there's something more like a gradual process, even a Chauvet. It's a 9,000 year window of painting. Um, we also know that the rise of symbolic culture is a process that takes place spread across the globe and probably was characterized by as many setbacks or lost civilizations as advances. New analysis shows that humans on Sulawesi, in the middle of the uh, Indonesian archipelago, right off the coast, south coast of Asia, humans on Sulawesi and nearby islands of modern Indonesia were creating cave art at the same time that the Chauvet painters were at work Despite the challenges of the terrain in, in getting to that, the, those locations, and with much less attention from Eurocentric scholars, uh, these caves have nonetheless yielded as over 120 sites of ancient art with new discoveries being made regularly. The best known of these paintings are found on Sulawesi with hand stencils dated to 39,000 years ago, 39,900 actually, just slightly older than their counterparts in Europe and a painting of a now extinct animal called the deer pig, badly deteriorated, but originally similar to the cave art that appears slightly later in France and Spain. Well, now on top of all of that, uh, which uh, argued, I, I, I want to suggest, for a um, dismantling of the so-called cultural Big Bang, at least as a geographically and temporally isolated moment, <laughs> taking place in Western Europe, conveniently, um, uh, already the evidence was, uh, had undermined that. Now add on top of this uh, the smashing through of the dates to 64,800 years ago with the uh, dating of the uh, uh, latest possible date for some of the Neanderthal art at various locations in Spain. Okay, so what are we going to do with all this? In one respect, the, challenge, the changing story of uh, human origins can be seen as just another sobering tale for theologians, a warning not to engage too closely with any scientific perspective, yesterday's or today's or the one from two weeks ago, um, while at the same time, of course, fully respecting the scientific enterprise as a reliable way of knowing something about nature. So, duly cautioned, uh, what can we say theologically? Well, for decades now, I don't have to, I shouldn't have to state the obvious, but for decades now, references to, to Adam and Eve as literal progenitors of humanity and as the historical explanation of the human moral condition uh, must be set aside. Even the classic out of Africa uh, story and, and even earlier evolutionary explanations uh, had made that point clear. Uh, What's uh, new now is that today we also need to let go of the notion that our species, Homo sapiens, came into existence biologically and genetically 
through one or more discrete changes that occurred with any kind of abruptness between 150,000 and 200,000 years ago, or that this species, this new species, replaced all other types and divergent forms of hominins without remainder. It also is increasingly clear that there is no biological or genetic moment of the origin of Homo sapiens, uh, that just as there is no biological uh, moment of origin, there is also no cultural correlate in the form of a creative Big Bang or a sudden lights-on moment when our human ancestors suddenly became capable of art, symbolic thought in general, moral awareness, or original wonder, uh, or, or religious wonder. In other words, in evolutionary and in cultural biology, there is no fairy dust. Right? Looking back, it is easy to see why the out of Africa account of the human, uh, of human uniqueness of our species and the abrupt appearance of our cultural capacities were richly appealing to uh, people religiously and, and uh, politically. Main attraction lay in the confidence with which we could say that all human beings living today are members of one species. Biologically speaking, races do not exist among humans out of Africa, certainly supports that view. The out of Africa scenario seemed like an overwhelmingly conclusive and final argument against the view that multiple human origins and separate evolution of today's uh, humanity on three continents might have resulted in three distinct races that divide living human beings. That previous view, common in the early 1900s, but widely dismissed in the 1950s, at least among experts, still has attraction to some. If only for that reason, out of Africa was an appealing option among evolutionary uh, theory, uh, theories, all the more so because the scientific evidence around 1990 seemed to support it so strongly. By contrast, the new view of our origin suggests that the human lineage consists of many divergent populations geographically dispersed across Africa and Eurasia with localized evolutionary adaptations occurring in times of separation that are offset by times of interbreeding and gene introgression. Divergence is beneficial because it allows more rapid evolutionary adaptation, while integration is beneficial because it maintains the reproductive unity of the lineage. This new understanding of how we got here is a challenge to theology, inviting us to reflect on new, in new ways about what we mean when we use terms like human or human uniqueness, or in how we think about our relationships between creation and redemption of humanity in the Incarnation, or how we argue today against the new justifications for racism and Conversely, in favor of the view that humanity is one. These three challenges, uniqueness, incarnation, and theological abhorrence of racism, uh, will occupy uh, the brief remainder of the paper. Turning first to the question of what is meant by human, or specifically by human uniqueness, we can see from our review of recent findings that the idea of a modern of a unique modern human species genetically or bio, uh, biologically separated from other hominins continues to lose meaning and coherence. There are, of course, many other perspectives, many other classrooms, many other departments of the university in which you might ask the question of human uniqueness. Uh, perhaps we are uniquely sinful uniquely self-conscious, uniquely able to blush or in need of blushing, as Mark Twain so famously said, or perhaps uniquely creative or inventive or destructive. There are obviously many ways in which humans stand out from among Earth's other creatures. A case can be made for any of those claims, but not on the basis of evolutionary biology. When we ask the question of human uniqueness from the science of human origins, however, it still makes, uh, makes sense, I want to suggest, to claim that the hominin lineage of all the lineages of all the creatures who have ever lived on Earth leads uniquely to this self-aware, creative, destructive animal that we fondly call Homo sapiens. 
Nothing like us exists on earth, and the hominin lineage uniquely leads to such a creature. What does not make sense is to say that, the, that Homo sapiens is a unique species among hominins, or that there is a moment in the evolutionary history of the human lineage when we, have, when we made a pivotal transition biologically or culturally from pre-human or almost human to really human. What then might theology today say about humanity as the creature who is uniquely declared to be in the image of God? We came into existence through an evolutionary passageway as described by the scientific approach to human origins. And so we can agree with Wenzel van Hoisting, among others, when he writes, the theological notion of the Imago Dei is powerfully revisioned, quote, uh, well, quote, quote all the way through, but now italicized, as emerging from nature itself, end of quote. In the end of Adam and Eve, I indicated my agreement with what I take to be van Hoisting's view that humans have a spiritual consciousness or that this has evolved or even that we might link this, I don't want to say equate this, but link this spiritual consciousness with the idea of the image of God. But then comes this challenge. The question is whether it evolved suddenly or slowly. It is obvious that it emerged, but when and how? Did it become culturally, did we become culturally sophisticated, moral uh, and spiritual beings in a flash? Is there really any clear dividing line between before and after? Based on a reasonable reading of the scientific evidence around the year 2000, Van Hoisting portrays the transition as rapid and abrupt. He speaks of the recency of the cultural, quote, Big Bang, um, the upper Paleolithic revolution, explosive growth of human creativity around 45,000 years ago, end of quote. Then he claims that, quote, all evidence points to the fact the behaviorally modern humans were astonishingly quick in developing their creative artistic skills within, uh, over the shortest period of time, end of quote. This view of the, quote, explosive growth of hum human creativity, end of quote, sits well with the then prevailing view of Homo sapiens as a unique species recently evolved in Africa. But as we have seen, this out of Africa theory must be reworked in light of recent findings. In fact, both scenarios, the out of Africa story and the cultural Big Bang scenario, need significant revision. The story of human origins, biological and cultural, is now a more complex story than ever before. It unfolds more slowly over hundreds of thousands of years of additional time over the entire African continent, with cultural awakenings spread out over greater amounts of time and space from Altamira to Sulawesi, and now even back into the age of the Neanderthals. What difference does the question of an abrupt versus a gradual process of human emergence make for theology? Both accept the evolutionary origins of humanity. What does the nature of the evolutionary process make? Um, uh, what, what does it mean, uh, or how does it make a theological difference? At the very least, theologians should be aware that now, more than ever, the notions of modern hom uh, humans or homo sapiens, as they, uh, uh, as they were used uh, very recently in scientific discussions of human origins, are increasingly difficult to define, especially if we are looking for boundaries or markers that distinguish the not yet human from early human. This means that theology should be cautious about any lines it might imagine drawing to separate modern humans from other humans or indeed from other hominids. More important, however, is the awareness that today's story of human origins is the story of the human lineage. We are the result of the whole lineage, the living composite of its developments in its totality, whether ancestral or not. Our origin can, origins cannot be drawn by straight lines, simple branches, or clean splits. The ancestral lines are interwoven, and the splits are anything but clean. It is a long story, one that is still almost completely unknown. What is clear now is that theology, a theology of human origins, must take up a 
lineage-centric approach. Earlier I quoted the observations of Ackerman uh, and others to the effect that we today are the product of repeated divergence and hybridization, or as I like to call it, convergence, divergence and convergence. We would not be what we are if we had evolved some other way. I mean, let that sink in existentially, but then use it as a springboard for pondering theological questions, such as the Christological question. We would not be what we are if we had evolved some other way. We, we are not the final twig on the branch at the end of a sequential progression from one species or form to the next, from Australopithecus to Homo habilis to Homo erectus to finally to us. None of these evolved from what came before. All of us evolved with what came before. Our past is more diversified and complex than we can know, and traces of its complexity in us today uh, still exist in, in us today in the form of our DNA sequences. At the very least, this affects how we see ourselves and our connection with our own deep past. Our past is in us. How then do we think of past populations of hominins, so diverse in form, sometimes with remarkable diversity, within a single community, some living at, a time, at the same time as others, uh, and others separated by millions of years? How should we view them? Are they merely archaic populations, as dead as the dinosaurs, or were they once communities in their own way, familial networks of mutual dependence, in which our ancestors, so different and yet so similar, were born and die as we do. Mostly they are completely lost to science. If their DNA is in us, then in a sense they are living still, and perhaps someday we will develop the tools to detect their presence and that of ghost populations from which we came. But more likely we will never know anything about them except that we would not exist had they not come first. As I put it in uh, the end of Adam and Eve, diverging we became many things. We became Neanderthals, uh, Denisovans, Neanderthals, and perhaps many other ancestral groups. By being them, we became us. Converging, we are still on our way to becoming one thing, one unified global human community. To this, theology adds, still perhaps more in the mode of aesthetics and doxology than in doctrine, that this is how God has made us. If we each are fearfully and wonderfully made, how much more is this true of our human lineage? As important as our aesthetic or mystical sense of connection to our past may be, or even our doxological expressions of gratitude for the grace and patience of our Creator, we want to understand as much as possible what all this means for core Christian doctrines such as the incarnation and redemption of humanity. Some, of course, will insist that one version or another of an historic Adam and Eve is essential to the coherence of, the Christian, of Christian theology. Like many others, I believe it is a far better strategy to replace that particular traditional view with another traditional view, a minority view to be sure, but another traditional interpretation of creation, Adam, Eve, and Christ. This alternative view is associated with theologians such as Irenaeus and many Orthodox theologians, and in the West among the Franciscans or those who embrace a position sometimes called supralapsarianism as opposed to infralapsarianism and that includes such pivotal figures as Friedrich Schleiermacher, Karl Barth, and my favorite, uh, Karl Rahner. Instead of seeing the work of Christ mainly as a rescue from fallenness and sin, theology today can embrace, uh, more fruitfully embrace this alternative. In this view, creation and incarnation are closely tied together, and the incarnation is seen as the completion of God's overarching plan for creation. We find a hint of this in Ephesians 1.10 where we read of God's, quote, plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in Christ, things in heaven, and things on earth, end of quote. 
Karl Rahner speaks of the inner connection between creation and incarnation this way. We are entirely justified in understanding creation and incarnation not as two disparate and juxtaposed acts of God outwards, which have their origin in two separate initiatives in God. Rather, in the world as it actually is, we can understand creation and incarnation as two moments and two phases of the one process of God's self-giving and self-expression, although it is an intrinsically differentiated process. End of quote. If the unity and the, of creation and incarnation is seen in this way, and if it is understood that the incarnation is the fulfillment of the creation, then it must be said that the creation is prepared for the incarnation, or more precisely, that God prepares the whole creation for the incarnation by the emergence of life, mind, and consciousness, which, at least on our planet, reaches its highest point in the human lineage. The actual historic process by which the creation is made capable of incarnation, this is the work of the Creator now, the actual historic process, a process best understood through scientific discovery and analysis, takes on profound theological significance. A lineage-centric view derived from the scientific perspectives on human origins should be understood as corresponding to the theological claim that God prepares the creation for incarnation, informing our understanding of how God readies the creation for its receive, to, uh, for its, uh, to receive its fulfillment in Christ. The human lineage is the defined locus of the Incarnation, the place we know within creation that is prepared for Incarnation. Again, as Rana puts it, the goal of the world is God's self-communication to it. And the entire dynamism which God has implanted in the process by which the world comes to be in self-transcendence, that's Rahner's equivalent for emergence, comes to be in self-transcendence, is already directed toward this self-communication and its acceptance by the world. To which he adds that the Savior, quote, cannot simply be God himself as acting in the world, but must be a part of the cosmos, a moment within its history, and indeed at its climax. And this is also said in the Christological uh, dogma. Jesus is truly human, truly a part of the earth, truly a moment in this world's biological process of becoming, a moment in humanity's natural history, for Jesus Christ is, quote, born of a woman, Galatians 4. Thus writes Rahner. We can think of this concretely in terms of the particularity of the incarnation of Jesus of Nazareth, born of Mary. His human nature is confessed creedally to be fully and entirely like ours. And while the writers of the Gospel did not know what we are talking about here in terms of human origins, they had no comprehension whatsoever the disparate sources of DNA in Jesus' own body, or that he had, let's say, Neanderthal DNA. Uh, in their own way, they were able to bear witness to the theological importance of these matters by attention they give to the genealogies of Jesus. In Luke 3, Jesus' ancestry is traced back to Adam, suggesting a universal lineage. In Matthew 1, Jesus is identified as a descendant of Abraham, emphasizing his Jewishness. But among Jesus' ancestors, there are four women beside Mary, and each is thought um, with, with some debate, of course, but each is thought to be a Gentile, suggesting that Jesus had mixed ancestry. And if there is a theological point to put on this unexplained textual oddity, it is surely made by Paul in Galatians, where we read, quote, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. End of quote, uh, Galatians 3.28. In his own humanity, Jesus is a Jew and yet somewhat a Gentile, as Matthew sees it. Or you could add to this, in his own humanity, Jesus was a modern and also somewhat a Neanderthal 
as we today would see it. Or as Paul sees it, ethnic identities and differences do not disappear, but they are brought together into a new unity in Christ. The unity of humanity in Christ is a work of God in progress, and pushing against it are the racist sentiments and supremacist ideologies that seem now to be re-energized around the world. Will the new story of human origins inspire new racist interpretations? Probably so. In fact, they already have. Claiming scientific support for an ideology is a very old tactic. The problem now is that the scientific counterargument is no longer based on what seems like a straightforward clarity of the out of Africa scenario. Now science must appeal instead to a somewhat less vivid idea of introgression as a persistent factor in the evolutionary history of the hominin lineage. How does a scientist explain to people today that yes, there is diversity across the globe, and even more diversity in our past, and that this diversity does not constitute separate races because there is persistent gene flow or intergression reuniting diverse communities in one global... How do you explain that in an age of Twitter? <laughs> the theologian will need to make the same argument, joining the scientist in insisting that the revised story of human origin is not suddenly a new friend of racism, but the theologian can only join the argument with a different consciousness, a painful awareness that what we blandly call introgression is perhaps, as often as not, a brutal process. I mean, who's to know? Who really is to know? But what are we talking about here when we speak of gene flow if it does not include such things as we know from our own recorded history as slavery, including sexual bondage, or rape, either as a strategy or a frequent consequence of war being done now. Uh, these things, or their Paleolithic counterparts, and again, who could know exactly what that was like? It is impossible to think on these things in a merely detached way. And yet, if the lineage-centric view is correct, as it seems to be, at least for now, then we have to say that we exist because of this past, and that we owe our existence to this process. Even more troubling is that we cannot help but say that this is how God made us. In one sense, there's nothing new here in saying that God creates through evolution, or that evolution includes unimaginable amounts of suffering that seem to serve, in some cases at least, no specific purpose, chiefly by animals wholly unrelated to us. And to be sure, the out-of-Africa story of human origins contained its own horrors, assuming that the modern humans had something to do with the disappearance of all the other forms of humanity in what would have been the first and really the ultimate case of ethnic cleansing. Here we face an old problem in a new form. Becomes, it comes to us as the cost of our existence, as the very lineage in which God is pleased to dwell. The Christian faith is no stranger to the profound contradictions of death and resurrection, violence and life, or brutality and redemption, fully aware of what introgression actually means, we find ourselves compelled to affirm, nonetheless, its outrageous necessity as the process, not just by which the human lineage is made, but by which we are made one, biologically. But more than that, we can point to the resonance between the biology of divergence and integration and the theology of the incarnation. These two are not the same thing. Recall Rahner saying they are fundamentally united and yet differentiated. They are not the same thing. But they are related to each other in a way that we might expect if Rahner is right in saying that we should understand creation and incarnation as two moments or two phases of one process. God prepares the creation for the incarnation by the emergence of hum the human lineage, as we now understand it, as described through the evolutionary dynamics 
that include divergence and introgression with its surprising complexity, its multiple strands and substrands, with high diversity even within single groups, with countless dead ends, with a clear trend toward greater homogeneity, toward one biologically unified humanity, prepared by the Creator for the Incarnation. What begins with creation is completed in the Incarnation of Jesus Christ, a process now only begun and whose glorious consummation lies beyond our imagination. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you.